everybody. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. I can hear you. Perfect. I can hear you. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. All right, so first off, if everybody can just mute your microphones, that would be very helpful. Um, so this lecture is called From Cairo to Columbus, FGM and the Egyptian Diaspora. Uh, just as a background, this is sponsored by the American Board Certified Doctors for Egypt, which is a 501c3 uh, based in DC. And it's a, um, it's a nonprofit that's dedicated to education and prevention and awareness campaigns and trainings. And uh, not only in the medical field, but also in the science uh, pharmaceutical and other areas. So this lecture is fairly long, uh, just so you know, we have two parts. The first part is based on, is focusing on globally and in Egypt. We'll go over the basic definitions of FGM, the health consequences, understanding the background of it, um, how its legal status has changed in Egypt and some of the more successful national efforts that have worked there. And then we're going to move on to the United States. We'll talk about the numbers, the challenges within the healthcare system, its legal status, which also changed this year, um, and some of the basic local resources that we can use here in Columbus, Ohio. So the first one is the definitions. What is FGM? So female genital mutilation, the definition is partial or total removal of external female genitalia or other injury or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. It is defined as a violation of human rights. It occurs to more than 200 million girls and women today have been cut, uh, most commonly between the ages of basically infancy and age 15 uh, in more than 30 countries in Africa and the Middle East. There's four main types. The first type is a removal of the clitoris. Uh, or the prepuce or the hood. The second part type is uh, includes a removal of the labia minora plus or, mar, plus or minus the majora. The third type is the most severe, which is known as infibulation, sometimes Sudanese or pharaonic. Uh, and this results in a narrowing of the vaginal opening and a creation of like a false seal that makes just that partial opening there. Uh, and it includes with or without type one and type two. Type four is anything else, such as pricking, piercing, incising, so on and so forth. I'm gonna show diagrams. So uh, it might be a trigger warning. If you wanna look away for about five to seven seconds, you can do that. This is basically the anatomy. So you have uh, the top of the female genitalia is the clitoris. The orgasmic root starts up here. It's like a collection of nerves and muscles and goes down both ways onto the labia minora and to the labia majora. Um, so type one is when the clitoris is removed. The clitoris is pretty much the corresponds to the male penis, basically. It is the organ of pleasure and the organ that has, cap has capabilities of actually, you know, um, sort of like an erection or ejaculation. And it's the main source of pleasure, I guess you could say, for women. So this area in type one, that area is removed. In type two, they take a portion of the labia minora as well. So it's a longer area that's sewn up. Type three, this entire area is sewn up, leaving a tiny opening uh, that just enough air, just enough for um, uh, you know the passage of urine and the fluid from uh, a menstrual flow. So this is the diagram how it would be, and then type four is everything else. In Egypt, the most common is the type one and type two. Other communities such as the Somali would have like the type three is more common. The health risks and complications are numerous, and I can't go into this long enough. Um, the first one is obviously the sexual health. Because there's a disruption in the natural kind of way that God created them, uh, created the women, uh, there's excessive bleeding. There's a lot of scar tissue from the way it was cut and the way it heals. So scar tissue is much more thinner than the regular skin, so there's a lot of bleeding. It can be very painful. Obviously, there's a lack of orgasm. Um, as you may or may not know, women already have a difficult time reaching orgasm because it's not really, you know, as related to the area, to the, uh, the process of penetration as much as it's related to the stimulus, stimulation of the clitoris, which is, like, as we mentioned, a separate kind of organ. Uh, so imagine if that area is also removed, there's almost a complete lack of orgasm. There's also increased risk of STDs, including HIV, because of this scar tissue is so thin. So it's easier for viruses uh, to actually make cross over that border and infect the cells. 
there's an increased risk of cancer cervix, which is the area that I became interested in this because as a cytopathologist, uh, women who have undergone FGM, they refuse to come do pap exams, pap smears and do GYN exams because it's like a repeated a repetition of the trauma of, of being uh, undergoing being cut. And then, like I said, similarly, the, um, you know, the barrier, the skin barriers, the cell barriers have all been altered through this uh, trauma. So there's an increased risk of HPV uh, viral infection. Interestingly enough, which is something a lot of people don't know, is that male partners are also affected. So 15% of men complain of erectile dysfunction of the partners, other sexual disorders. They also can have uh, various types of penile injury, depending on how extensive the scarring is or how narrow the opening is in the case of infibulation. Uh, uh, so uh, urinary difficulties, sometimes there's like longer times to urinate, repeated urinary infections, urinary fistulas are very common. Uh, a fistula would be a connection between, um, like, for example, the vaginal opening and uh, the urinary path, because that area, like has, I said, has undergone trauma, repeated infections, and so on. GY, GYN obstetric complications are very common. So again, they're more susceptible to infections that goes up into the pelvic tract, up into the uh, uterus, leading to pelvic inflammatory disease. Repeated infections can actually lead to infertility. A lot of birth trauma, 65% have extensive tears. So the baby's coming out through the tract, which has already been cut, and that scar tissue is weak. It gets cut even more. Um, menstruation can be completely debilitating. Some of these girls will stay home for weeks, like 10 days to two weeks, just because of the pain. Uh, and then, of course, obstruction of labor. If that happens, you end up with stillbirth, cerebral palsy, et cetera. Psychological trauma, 80% have anxiety disorders, 30% have PTSD. Other things includes keloids, scarring, abscesses, and of course, death related to any one of these. If there's repeated infection, um, if there's, you know, they get a virus or during the process of cutting itself or during the GYN and obstetric complications. Um, so this one study found that if countries actually abandon FGM, the cost would decrease by 60% over the next 30 years. Treatment of health complications go up to 1.4 billion US dollars per year in 27 of these high prevalence countries. So there's a lot of confusion between male circumcision and FGM until today. Occasionally I find an article that is talking about FGM and they use the word female circumcision. Uh, it's completely wrong. And I want to make that really clear, the difference between male circumcision and FGM or genital mutilation. So male circumcision, for one thing, it does have a religious basis, and we'll go into this in a little bit. There's no religious basis for the FGM. Male circumcision uh, is removal of the skin that covers the top of the penis, okay? The penis itself is not altered. While in FGM, the female equivalent of the penis, which is the clitoris, is removed or damaged. Uh, the most sensitive area responsible for sexual pressure is actually the dorsum of the penis. This is not changed, so it stays as it is. While for women, uh, the most sensitive area responsible for orgasm or sexual pressure is removed, which is the clitoris, and as we mentioned, the orgasmic pathway, which goes from the clitoris down to the two labia. Uh, male circumcision has shown to have a decreased rate of infections, transmission of STDs, while, as we mentioned, FGM has an increased rate. Uh, there's a decreased rate lifelong penile cancer because there's a decreased chance of HPV, which causes penile cancer. While FGM for women, um, there's an increased risk, lifelong risk of cervical cancer. Uh, the CDC yes. recommends male circumcision in, um, in AIDS prevalence areas uh, as part of their guidelines. And FGM is not recommended by any medical or health institution. Uh, I'm just gonna remind everyone, please uh, mute your microphones. So the last thing I'm going to throw in here right for this area is because people sometimes throw this out like, hey, wait a minute, you know, you have all these fancy, you know, plastic surgery clinics in, you know, LA who are doing, um, you know, clitoral hood reduction. This is completely different. Clitoral hood reduction is known as vaginal rejuvenation. This is done by adults. It's approved by American Society of Plastic Surgeons and it's done through, it's a controlled process uh, which in which they work through uh, the areas which are preventing a woman from achieving orgasm for um, whatever reasons to find the appropriate size and shape and everything that would be appropriate for her. Um, that's not what we're talking about at all here. We're talking about FGM, which is a human rights violations done to children's and there's no medical approval at all. 
So now I'm going to talk about why. So why would something so horrific be done? First of all, we have to put it into perspective that this is historically has been around for a very long time. Uh, all the way from 500 BC, Herodotus described it in some of the uh, Phoenici Phoenicians and so on. Uh, 24, this Greek, 24 BC, a Greek geography described it. It has some mythologic and pharaonic origins for defining gender, apparently. And even the word for infibulation comes from the word fibula, which was used by ancient Romans. They used these pins to pin the labia together in their slaves and somehow that increased their, um, you know, the less, that decreased the chance of pregnancy. And so therefore uh, they got a higher price, something like that. Uh, even as recently as the 1800s, uh, there was Victorian ideas of health and cures. There's this one guy called Dr. Baker who noticed that his insane female patients used to uh, masturbate a lot. And so the way to stop them was to do, uh, you know, an FGM. And this fell out of favor. Interestingly, if you read about it, it fell out of favor, not just not only because the other surgeons disagreed, but also because the husbands of these wives were unhappy that it was done without their permission. So uh, today's world, there's a lot of socioeconomic factors that go in between this. And it's kind of hard, of us, hard for a lot of us to relate to this when we think of, uh, when we come from societies where mar <clears throat> marriage is sort of like a luxury, not a luxury, but it's not really essential for our survival. Uh, we look for companionship, for example, rather than economic security, not to say that it doesn't still exist, but um, in the areas where FGM is most common, you'll find that marriage is like considered sacrosanct, like it's, it's like a huge deal. Um, and there's an ingrained concept that FGM would make these women more marriageable by controlling their uh, sexuality. Um, it also has partial related to rite of passage in a lot of these cultures. Um, and sometimes even in areas where female um, premarital sex is permitted, it's still done. Uh, cultural identity with names translated to we the circumcised, giving themselves like, you know, once again, the word circumcised is used incorrectly. Uh, transition to being an adult member. And it's interesting because a lot of times the parents who make these decisions uh, genuinely fear for their daughters. And this is an important point when we come to the, when we start to talk about uh, social services and the idea of child abuse, because by definition it's child abuse, but these parents genuinely are not trying to abuse their daughters, they actually feel it's in their best interest. So um, there's a lot of gender roles, okay, as we mentioned, social control over her sexual pleasure through the clitoridectomy, social control over having a baby by infibulation, right? There's no space for the baby to come out. Uh, there's ideas of femininity, modesty, there's even words like tahara, which means cleanliness, there's a lot of religious misconceptions as well, which we will go into, uh, but there's genuinely a, um, not only a misunderstanding of the religious practice, but a hesitancy from religious leaders to speak out against it. There's the concept of politicized religion, which makes a lot of people unwilling to trust the religious leaders because they are, you know, adapt, adopted by the political leaders in power. We mentioned already the confusion. There's also folklore and medical misconceptions. So some cultures, there's these ideas that the clitoris is gonna to grow to the size of a penis or it's gonna be toxic. There's also a lot of confusion, medical, medical misconceptions. Well, if the medical doctors in Egypt, for example, 70% of FGM is actually performed by medical doctors. Well, if the medical doctors and the midwives and the women they go to for local healing are the ones actually doing it, this sends the wrong messages, right? And then you have political community leaders, schooling, media, a whole lot of other stuff and responsibilities that are not addressed adequately, for example, in sex education. So I'm going to go over religion for a minute because um, unfortunately, this concept of FGM is attributed to a lot of times to Muslims and it actually has no basis. It's actually performed by not uh, certain groups, for example, the, the Ismaili Dawoodi Boras. It's practiced in certain Muslim countries, not all Muslim countries. So Somali, Egypt, Djibouti, other things. It's not mentioned in the Quran. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, there's something called the Hadith, which is the oral transmission or the written transmission of something that the Prophet Muhammad was, uh, was set, said. And it corresponds with um, the general messages of what's in the Quran and is considered either strong or weak. So if it's strong, you'll find the mainstream Muslims following it. If it's weak, you'll find smaller groups, for example, following it. And so unfortunately, there are smaller groups that do follow a weak hadith. Um, but the general, the general mainstream is that the strongest hadiths that um, 
reinforces the importance of creating that God created man in the best of its forms, reinforces the uh, importance of health, and reinforces the important reinforces the importance of not doing harm. So uh, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, known as Ali Goma, who is the leader of a ancient institution, religious institution known as the Azhar. Muslims don't have like a pope who they follow, but they do follow larger institutions, you know. So Ali Goma made it very clear. He said that this has to be stopped uh, in support of the highest values of Islam, doing no harm to another uh, in accordance to the commandments of the Prophet Muhammad. And there's a huge number of, of hadith that talk about the importance of health, the importance of seeking health, medical treatment, and so on. Uh, Professor Ali Goma has done incredible work on this for years and years and years. Um, it's practiced by followers of the Christian religion, also in these areas, so Egypt, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Nigeria, um, even though, once again, it's not mentioned in the Bible, the Pope has made it very clear that it's a type of degradation, it's a type of mutilation, a type of slavery and commercialization, and that it has to be stopped. It's also followed by, fact, by followers of, uh, the Jew, of Judea, Judaic uh, tradition mainly in the Ethiopian Jews, a small group known as the Beta Israel Falashas who are, met, who are in Ethiopia, pretty much nowhere else. And again, it's not mentioned in the Torah or Talmud. And again, it's followed by the last large group in Africa, which is known as animism, which, animism, which is an ancient belief system where um, the animate and inanimate have spirits um, and it's incorporated into their religious uh, traditions. So, um, as you can see, it's mainly culture, but there is a very large uh, religious responsibility. These are examples of uh, where like, for example, the Coptic church launches a massive campaign. Um, here's the Coptic voice where they're talking about FGM. Uh, here in 1991, 14,000 Egyptian uh, Ethiopian Jews went to Israel. And once they converted to Orthodox Judaism, they also stopped doing it. Uh, this was a, um, in 2007, 2008, uh, the uh, Azhar and the other religious scholars got together in Egypt and they published why, the reasons why FGM is not part of the Islamic faith. Um, <clears throat> this is an article about a Somali sheikh, uh, sheikh leading a seven-year campaign, uh, the Red Cross involving African tribal chiefs. And then here, this is actually a picture that was taken just three weeks ago. Again, Ali, Professor Ali Goma is standing, talking about the religious uh, aspect of how FGM is a sin and against uh, the, the tenets of Islam in uh, the Senate in Egypt. So this diagram really kind of summarizes why something like this happens. So you have a myth. The myth is that FGM is good. And then you have a misconception in the religion that it's necessary for cleanliness misconception about conception about hygiene, right? And then a misconception or something that has been incorporated in society to reinforce this myth and have it continue. And then you have community enforcement, things like divorce, marriage, they're refusing to marry women who have not undergone it. Another community enforcement, talking about these supernatural forces and so on. And then there's things like celebration, like a lot of cultures, if a girl has undergone FGM, they give her presents, she gets lots of attention, and so on and so forth. And actually, this dynamic applies to pretty much any myth, like even things like, uh, you know, the myth of COVID is not a virus. Okay, we go to our, we're protected by our faith, we, uh, it's not going to happen to us. And then it's reinforced by, you know, cultures or uh, societies or music or something like that. So this dynamic is not new, but you can see it very clearly in the dynamic of FGM. So how do you transform a social norm, right? First thing you have to understand is how is this social norm expressed in the society? How extensive is it? Is it affecting, like I said, marriage, childhood? Uh, is there an economic factor in it? Um, the uh, the society capacity to sell things or to or to move or to so on and so forth. How involved is it? Is it just something that you know is only involved by women, or do men have a say in it as well? How old? You know, we're going to show examples later of how the grandmother is the one who is the one who's who makes the decisions, not the father. So, well, what do you do then? 
And then the really most important thing is how you really need an integrated multi-sectoral approach on so many different levels to actually succeed in changing any kind of society norms. And you can see that right now, like with the COVID, how you have all different levels, politics, religions, society leaders, activists, people on all different levels trying to fight um, the misconceptions or uh, the lies. And so it's the same thing. And it's very important to realize that not every approach will work in every single place, in every village, in every tribe, in every country. So let's talk a little bit about globally. What have the efforts been? Because there's been a huge effort to end FGM all over um, with a, whole, a huge number of different you know, NGOs and groups. Uh, starting all the way from 1997, uh, 2007, you have the joint program. 2008, uh, 2010, 2012, the General Assembly actually adopted a resolution for the elimination of FGM. And in 2015, member states decided that they were going to make part of the sustainable development agenda that by 2030 is going to be completely eradicated. Um, things like evidence based guidelines have been helpful, a clinical handbook, these are all important steps globally. The progress, uh, they did a, a demographic and health survey, which is basically a questionnaire, and they sent this to 67 homes in 24 countries, and they found, concluded that there was a lot of gaps. There are some countries that have made no progress at all. Other countries, there's a complete loss of data, such as Yemen, because of the unrest there. And even though FGM has decreased on the global level, uh, it is the goal of eliminating it by 2030 is pretty much out of reach. So it's unfortunate. So let's talk about uh, Egypt. Egypt is number six. You have countries like Somalia where it's 98% and Egypt is around 87%. The trend is decreasing. So that is good news. Um, if you compare the percentage of women between the age of 45 and 49 who have been cut in Egypt, you'll find 96%, while between the ages of 15 and 19, it's decreased 81%. It's not as much as other countries, Liberia, for example, 85% has gone down to 44%. Or a country like Kenya, which had 50%, which is already less than others, um, and now 15% in the age group. So even though it is decreasing, so Egypt has gone from 96 to 81, it's still not where we wanna be. There is a definite difference between the locations, between urban and rural. Um, and there's definitely an increase as you go south towards Sudan. So if you go down, so general geography, you have Sudan down here and you also have Ethiopia and other countries where FGM is very much prevalent. Um, so uh, there's also uh, an element of the wealth, uh, the wealth factor. So 94% in the lowest wealth bracket, while 69% in the highest wealth. And we mentioned before, 74% are type 1, 26% type 2. And type 3 starts to increase more as you go towards the areas of Sudan. So let's talk a little bit about the legal status of FGM, because this definitely reflects on um, Egyptians coming to traveling back and forth. So in 2008, Egypt banned FGM as a, as a misdemeanor. This was the first time there was actually a law as well as removing the concept of medicalization. So before that, there was a loophole where if the doctor did it, it would be okay. Uh, in this case, if the doctor did it, it's still not okay, but um, it wasn't a very strong law. It was a misdemeanor. A fine of a thousand uh, pounds is not a lot of money. Um, and it pretty much wasn't enforced. In 2016, they criminalized it and made it a criminal act. Uh, and as well also included anybody like the parents who request it or tried to make it happen, including people who might be working with them. Um, five to seven years in the case of a permanent disability or death um, and so on. So 2021, this is just three weeks ago actually, after following a apparently very heated debate in the Senate. Um, for one thing, they expanded the definition of FGM to include anything, mutilation, injuries, it doesn't matter the extent, uh, five to 10 years in the cases of like permanent disability or death. And what they did is really make the uh, law against doctors much more severe, one of the more severe laws uh, in, um, in comparison to other countries, uh, because uh, like I said, about 70% of FGMs are performed by either nurses or doctors. And uh, they can have up to 20 years um, of imprisonment in the cases in the case of where a, a child dies. 
And also they're dismissed from their position for five years and the hospital where they work or the clinic where they work is also closed for five years. So this is really a, a fairly strong uh, law. And in addition to the other things as like, you know, the parents and so on. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to the amazing women of the Senate. They all put this uh, frame that says, which means protect her from FGM. Uh, we have here Dr. Abdelab Elfi and uh, Amira Sabir who have worked actually very closely with ABCDE and have a long history of working for the health of women and children in Egypt through uh, their nonprofit there known as EMA. So um, this is an example of, uh, we've seen the legal success, but the legal success had a long process. And I'm just gonna show you to this because this is really important of how uh, first of all, there is more than one group that worked on this. You have the National Council for Childhood and Motherhood. You have the United Nations Development Program, a donor assistant group. If you look at this donor assistant group, you have uh, Procter & Gamble, you have Vodafone, you have Canadian Embassy, you have uh, you know, the EU, you have so many groups who are willing to fund this and stand behind this movement. Uh, media, policymakers, activists, this was what led to actually the, um, the landmark fatwa by the Grand Mufti, which we showed the picture of Ali Goma uh, condemning FGM. Uh, a child law, a massive, a larger child law, which in addition to FGM also addressed things like street children and trafficking and so on. Um, and then they worked a lot in the villages, what they called it the FGM free village model. And with this model, they worked with the village officials, religious leaders, community members and intervention groups and uh, the, the initial study that came from this was that 76% of the uh, individuals in the intervention group who received the information and whose daughters were cut, they decided that using that information convinced them not to cut their daughters. So uh, this was a successful model. It is continuing. It is ongoing. So if you go to the website for the National Council for Women or even their Facebook page, you can see uh, the progress. You could see uh, the partners. If you notice here, you have the law enforcement, you have Azhar, you have the churches, uh, civil society, the number of women and children who uh, they have uh, interacted with media campaigns and so on. These are pictures of actually going door to door knocking. And um, there's a lot of effort being done in this. The newer thing now is there's actually a helpline where people can call in and say that, you know, I'm afraid that my, you know, my husband or my wife is going to take my daughter to do this. Uh, there's a National Council for Women's Hotline as well. And they also established a national committee, committee to eradicate FGM, which has a uh, more far-reaching uh, power. Um, if you go to the website, the, uh, the Facebook page for the National Council for Women, you can see some of their medias, uh, their media work, um, and some of the commercials. So this is, I just took a screenshot of this because it really shows, you know, the uh, element of having the father protect the daughter in a patriarchal society like that in Egypt. This could actually work really well. And if you translate it, it says, we won't repeat what happened in the past. That's enough of FGM. And a lot of these, um, you know, these ads or infomercials are, are actually very, um, very effective. So that was Egypt. Now we're going to move on to, to the U.S. and then kind of bring them both together. So for the U.S. estimates, okay, there was a couple studies that were published by the CDC in 1997, 2002, um, <clears throat> using the Population Reference Bureau. And what they did is they took the numbers of people who had immigrated from different countries where FGM is prevalent and using the percentages of FGM in those countries, they extrapolated to see what would be um, the worst case scenario or the most accurate scenario, I suppose, if they were corresponding in percentages. So if you have 100 people coming from Egypt and 81% of women, 100 women, and 81% of those women are have undergone FGM, then those are at risk, right? And then using that, those numbers, they extrapolated also if those women have kids or if, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So using the percentage of prevalence of FGM in those countries, um, they concluded the following. They said that there's a four time increase since 1997, 513,000 women or girls are at risk in the US. 101,000 of these are uh, of Egyptian origin. Okay, 
So they divided it uh, between by age groups, 15 to 19, you have 81% of those women are cut. Um, and then uh, based on the most recent surveys, uh, and that was from, in this particular study, they're using 2008. And so therefore, 101,000 women are at risk if they, uh, because of the country of origin of Egypt. So if you look at the Population Reference Bureau, there's actually a map that can show you these areas. Um, it varies widely. Uh, in a lot of ways, it corresponds to where the majority of Egyptians are. So uh, Egyptians in the US, you have about 248,000 Egyptian immigrants. Um, the majority come through either diversity, like through the green card lottery, or they are immediate relatives. And then you also have an increasing uh, group that are coming as refugees in the most recent, uh, you know, after the um, 2011 um, um, revolution. So if you look at the cities that are most, have the largest group of Egyptians, you have New York, Los Angeles, DC. And if you look over here, you'll find that these areas have the largest numbers, New York, uh, New Jersey, uh, DC, LA, and over here in Columbus, Ohio, it's 18,154. Now, the problem with these numbers is that it's not real-time data. Basically, they're extrapolating. So somebody like myself would be included in that number because my parents are both Egyptian. They immigrated here. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't take into consideration things like, for example, urban versus rural. Like we mentioned, the urban percentages are much less than people who are coming from rural areas. Um, unfortunately, there's no national data collection service or tracker to actually see. It doesn't take in socioeconomic or educational factors. Undocumented immigrants, there's a large number of undocumented Egyptians as well. We don't know about them. And then there are some groups that weren't even included, like the Dawood Boras. Uh, the other thing is prevalence data from countries may be inaccurate or incomplete. And behaviors do change with immigration and with general changes. Like as we saw, like the um, the Jewish Falashas, when they became Orthodox Juda Judaism and they immigrated to Israel, they changed. So immigration does change behaviors and you have to be able to, to follow that and see the extent. So we are all waiting for the results of the NORC study. So the NORC study was uh, basically the CDC engaged with NORC, which is uh, the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Uh, they did a pilot study in 2019 and we're waiting to see the results that will be released in 2021. They are doing six major communities to assess the extent and hopefully get us more accurate numbers as to how many women um, and girls are actually at risk of undergoing FGM. They're also going to uh, study the attitudes, health experiences, and based on those planned programs to fight this more extensively. So this will be exciting to follow and see what happens. So um, I did sort of a pseudo study. It's not very scientific because I'm in the center of it. And what I mean by I'm in the center of it, meaning that I asked my friends to fill this out. I posted on the Egyptian women group on Facebook. I did a targeted ad uh, targeting uh, you know, people in Ohio. And in Ohio, I asked these women, how many women and girls alive in the USA do you know right now that actually have had FGM done to them? And we had 16 positive responses. Half of them were from Egypt, okay? Six of them said they knew one to three women. Two of them said they knew 10 or more. Um, the people of African, African origin, five of them said they knew 10 or more. Uh, so when we kind of put them all together, depending on whether they all happen to know the same women, which is not likely, or there are these 10 women are all 10 different women, just having me in the center point, there's at least 94, you'd have at least 78 uh, total women and then ongoing 94 and beyond. So this is important just because um, I don't want us to think that it's a huge thing that we can't really try. Actually, maybe just having one person to talk about this like I am today could reach a circle of a lot of women and um, a lot of more women could actually get the help they need. So why is it being underreported? Um, for one thing, there's the legal system in the US has been very, very confusing. There has been a numerous loopholes, numerous entities, and it was confusing. You know, uh, health services, 
are lacking. We will go through this, how a lot of the self health services, there's a lack of formal training. There's no ICD tracking numbers. Um, a lot of the victims might be uninsured. Uh, there's a lack of comprehensive FGM clinics, although they do exist. Uh, lastly, you have social services and schools. There's a lot of distress. We had a meeting once with, um, I was working with My Project USA, and we had a meeting with Franklin County uh, Services, and they said that they had maybe one or two cases over the past 10 years. Well, part of that is just because people are distrustful towards, um, you know, the concept of a government run um, you know, uh, social services, and we'll go into that in a little bit more. There's also a lack of education, sex ed, and so on. So let's talk a moment about the U.S. legal system, because things have changed this year as well. Uh, you have 39 states, so you have two different things that go on in the U.S., which is confusing for a lot of people. You have state laws, and you have federal laws. So state laws, you have 39 uh, states that have laws. Each of these states are actually different. And if you go to Equality Now, they have a really good table that divides it over the main points of each kind. And so for example, um, a place like New York, um, it, it applies to minors. Uh, the parents are subject to a prosecution, but there's no provision for vacation cutting or sending the girl over to another state to be cut or another country even. Um, but they agree that cultural and rituals are not a defense and there is a provision for community education and outreach, which is really cool. Uh, Ohio, in comparison, if you look over here, only two of these are there. Um, and uh, you, it can lead to imprisonment two to eight years or a fine of up to 15,000, up to 25,000. So Ohio actually criminalized FGM just recently. And this is recently as in I'm saying 20, late 2018, early 2019. Um, and um, it's considered, as I said, a second degree felony. Uh, there's no statute for vacation cutting, which means that it's not against, uh, they can't be prosecuted for sending their daughters somewhere else to be cut. There is no education or training, which means kind of stops there. You've got to be able to go beyond that, right? To actually get to people and help them and, and reach victims and reach potential people at risk. Parents and guardians are not prosecuted. This is kind of hard because on one hand, you, you know, you want to say that this is wrong and this is against the law, but at the same time, you're kind of leaving that loophole for a guardian to not be prosecuted. That's kind of hard. Law applying to only to minors. This is also somewhere I stop because a lot of these cultures, including the Egyptian one, for example, the girls stay with their families up until, you know, over 18. They stay with them until they get married, for example. So um, there's a lot more to be done within uh, the, the Ohio um, state law. Now, some of you may remember this because this was very shocking in 2017 when um, a couple of Michigan doctors, they were part of a small sect called um, the Dawood Boras, um, and uh, they were uh, charged. This uh, particular doctor had done over a hundred cases of cutting women over a course of 10 years. And unfortunately, all the charges were dropped. Why? Because one, Michigan didn't have a state law at that time for them to be prosecuted in uh, the state of Michigan. And so they were prosecuted through the federal law and the judge who uh, was there said basically that, um, that the law is not um, adequate. Like they can't, it can't be used to uh, prosecute this case because FGM is a local criminal activity. And, um, you know, and it just wasn't clear enough. And unfortunately, um, the Department of Justice decided not to, uh, to fight to defend that law. Basically, they agreed that the wording of the law was not strong enough. And so that was that. So, um, all right, so this is just the basic landmark offense. You have 1996, that was the first time that uh, asylum is granted to women uh, who are fleeing FGM. Uh, 1996, there's the Federal Prohibition of FGM Act, 2013, Transport of GF FGM Act, and then 2017, this was when this federal law, all of these together, could not stand up in court, unfortunately. So basically, FGM is a local criminal activity, the states need to regulate it, not Congress, and so the Department of Justice decided not to appeal it. They agreed with the Judge Friedman that it's, there's a constitutionality problem with the wording, and so unfortunately, from early 2019, all the way until this January 2021, there was 
the United States was a country without a active law, federal law against FGM. And I hate to think of the number of, of cases that potentially girls who got cut because we're in a country that does not have a law and they might have been in a state that also doesn't have a law, you see. So it's, it's very unfortunate, but the good news is that yes, on the 21st of uh, September, the House of Representatives passed the Stop FGM Act and it was signed into law, ironically, by uh, President Trump before he left office on January 5th. And what it did is it updated the definition, it clarified who is accountable, and uh, it made reporting a requirement for federal agencies. It also clarified uh, the role between the state and uh, the federal government. Uh, it re confirmed, uh, reaffirmed the concept of interstate commerce or you know, women going across the state boards. And it was signed into law and we thank Representative Sheila Jackson Lee for sponsoring it. And this is really actually really nice because I gave a lecture similar to this just six months ago and I was telling everybody to please call your representatives to move this along and have it pass through uh, the Senate and become a law. And now if you go onto congress.gov, you can see that it is a law. So this is actually really good news because that means even if states don't have a strong uh, FGM law, um, people can be prosecuted using the federal one. Now, um, the problem comes when, uh, when victims are taken out of the United States. And uh, it's really, really important for any nonprofit working on this or individuals working on this that we actually have to work with ICE, Homeland Security and the FBI as partners. And um, this is kind of hard because obviously, you know, it, it's been uh, maybe the last few years, ICE has, you know, has not been, somebody who, you know, an entity that people think of as partners, right? But definitely they do need the partners because sometimes these uh, officers and, um, and services are the last ones to see these victims before they leave America. And this is like the last chance to really help them. So um, this, was, this was a nice um, uh, activity they did in 2019, which was called Operation Limelight. And it was based on the UK. The UK has actually had a lot more experience fighting FGM um, over the years um, than uh, the U.S. has. And what they did is they went to the major, the major hubs where people are traveling to countries where FGM is common, and they stop, talk with the women, talk with the men, talk with the people traveling. Uh, they're trained to kind of pick up certain responses, uh, give them brochures, uh, identify potential victims. I wanted to see how many victims they found. They don't have that information anywhere, but it would be interesting to know. Um, and explain to them the consequences of being involved too. There's also an ICE tip line for people who want to say like, I know so-and-so is gonna be carried out of the, uh, you know, traveling out of the country to get their daughter, you know, cut. Uh, so there is an FD uh, and an, on an, an anonymous online tip form, form. And this is really, really super important for there to be more and more of this kind of trainings. And I'd add to it if you actually have victims uh, you know, join these programs so they can talk even uh, to the people who are traveling. Um, this is a sticker that is put in the toy, the uh, yeah, the toilets, pretty much the bathrooms in uh, the UK, and it would be nice to have something similar here. Uh, there's definitely a large need for cooperation across the borders. We need cooperation between Egypt and the US and the usual routes that people take to go to Egypt, such as through the UK or Germany or other common routes. And um, I put here an example of Declaration Action Plan to End Cross FGM by Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, the East African Community Prohibition Act, Kenya, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. We need similar acts like this. So now, like if somebody goes from Kenya to South Sudan to do it, well, they can't do that anymore because um, this would be enacted and they would be stopped. But something like this may be translated into Arabic, you know, would make a big, a huge difference. So um, another area that's a huge challenge for victims here in the US is the healthcare system. First of all, there is no standardized screening. If you go to the Department of Health of the UK in the UK, they have a standardized screening form that pretty much any specialty could use. And they actually follow this algorithm and then it tells them where to go from here. Okay, so is the patient under, over 18? If the parents have undergone FGM, 
and they do a risk assessment and so on and so forth. We definitely need standardized screening, something that's culturally sensitive, translation services, um, and it needs to be done for everybody. I mean, practically look at all of these specialties are specialties that an FGM victim would go to pediatrics, psychiatry, physical therapy, OBGYN, obviously family med, internal medicine, derm, plastic surgery, urology. So like somebody might come to their family practice and say, you know what? I keep having urinary infections. Okay. Well, the family medicine, it would be better to actually do a GYN exam and see, has this patient been cut and then offer her help, for example, and then go through the next uh, screening stage for the other family members. That's an example of what is needed, which is not available. Formal training. So this was an interesting <coughs> study that was done by Dr. Ivana, um, and she's well known in uh, doing uh, reconstructive surgeries in Pennsylvania. And they did a 26 question survey to 2,508 active American Society of Plastic Surgeons, and there was only 180 who responded. So right away, you can tell it's not really a priority. It's not really something that people are interested in. Uh, only 5% reported any formal training. And so the conclusion that there's definitely an existing knowledge gap and a need for formal training. So uh, if you go online and look for web-based kits, this was a really interesting article where they went through all of the web-based kits for uh, all kinds, and there's a huge amount of resources out there, but the ones that are aimed for health professionals, um, they provide a lot of factual content, uh, but they lack a lot about the skills and how to implement this stuff into your practice. Okay, I have a clinic. How do I implement this the area into my clinic and actually make it work for my patients? Mental health services, again, this is an area uh, that we definitely need more cultural competence and training associated traumas, pre-treatment services, post-treatment services. We need it to be affordable and accessible uh, and integrated within the primary team. This is an example of some of the more um, um, cultural, <coughs> culturally aware resources for uh, mental health providers. Um, but definitely this is something that they need to work towards, like sign up for or to buy the book or to learn it as part of their training. And the reason I say this is this is a perfect example of where you really need all of these specialties to work together. And that is the most ideal situation is that a clinic has everything, okay? So this one, for example, the American Psychological Association had this article about how uh, this patient worked with an OBGYN nurse and her therapist at the same time, okay? And what they did is they used a system, uh, systematic desensitization program to prepare her for intercourse. This woman was completely unable to have any type of sexual intercourse because of uh, the damage. And so she learned relaxation techniques and so on, as well as learning how to use dilators that, uh, you know, and the OBGYN uh, followed that to, um, you know, until the patient was able to actually, um, you know, actually uh, presume having a sexual intercourse. And so the ideal situation is you would have intake screening and then that person would be transferred to a place where they could receive therapy, receive surgery, have uh, after the surgery, have maybe couples therapy. And then these patients need physical therapy for pelvic uh, floor muscles, like for, um, for a long time after that, especially for urinary incontinence and so on. Uh, prevention and screening, STDs, like we said, women who have undergone FGM are at higher risk for uh, HPV. They need to be able to have more adequate screening. They need to be vaccinated against HPV. And then, of course, you have the issue of insurance. Um, so a country like the UK, you know, their insurance covers everybody. In a country like the US, you have a lot of people who don't have insurance. So, and then legal help if necessary. So FGM clinics, if you go again to the UK, you can just type in FGM clinic and all of these clinics will show up. Uh, not to say it doesn't exist here. There are FGM clinic. One of them is uh, if you go to the med website for Penn Medicine, uh, which is like I said, Dr. Ivana, and uh, you can actually find a doctor. You, they can help people if they're coming from out of state. Uh, the American Women's uh, African Center, um, the African Women's Center in um, in Harvard. This is a huge center that has done numerous studies and uh, it's run, run by a doctor. Her name is Dr. Noel and she's originally from Sudan and she did a huge, uh, huge amount of work on this and, um, and you know, 
um, not only in awareness, but also in just improving the techniques for, um, for reconstructive surgery. So an FGM clinic would be nice if we could have that here in Ohio. And I wanna just throw this in. This was from Dr. Noel when she did this, um, this uh, study on, um, on 40, mostly Somali women. Here she is, she is being honored by the Arab American uh, Foundation of, Amer of uh, the US. Um, and it's really interesting because if you look at this, you have 20% were aperunia, which means they weren't having intercourse at all. Um, a lot of them come because they're pregnant. It's the perfect time to talk to these women and really try to help them get the help they need. Dysmenorrhea, 30%, they're very painful periods, difficulty urinary, uh, urinating. And uh, interestingly enough, 48% had an intact clitoris buried beneath the scar. And that's interesting because the clitoris is not always completely removed. And if you can remove some of that scar tissue and kind of expose that, um, you know, the collection of nerves and muscles that are responsible for, um, uh, for the uh, sexual pleasure and the orgasmic response, then these women actually have a chance to have things go back to normal. And um, none of these women had any type of post-operative complications. And look at these numbers, 94% would recommend it, 100% were satisfied, 100% felt their appearance had improved, 100% were sexually satisfied. So it's really, really important for us to encourage victims to go and get treatment, go, to help, go ask for help, uh, see what can be done from a surgery standpoint. And then, like I said, if we can support them with everything else, including therapy, uh, physical therapy, uh, pelvic floor exercises, and so on, that would be perfect. So the other area that's lacking, uh, needs a lot of work is US social services, the schools, the resources and challenges. So you do have the end FGM uh, CUS network. If you go look there, there's a huge number of resources that can be used. Um, uh, these are examples of a list of all kinds of things that you can use for education and training. Uh, specifically for schools though, we don't have anything that is consistent everywhere. And even in Columbus, Ohio, I, I'm personally, I'm not aware of it being taught in any of the schools. It might be. Um, but like, for example, in the UK, again, like I said, they have a little bit more experience than we have had um, in fighting this. Um, so in February 2019, uh, you can actually look up what they'll be studying, uh, but FGM would be taught in schools. Uh, this was um, a... Um, a resource that I found uh, called uh, by the nation's voice for urban education. This is a group of schools. <clears throat> and uh, since FGM is common in maybe urban settings in the U S um, they actually made this resource. And it's very good because it shows you the different levels of responsibility and it shows you the different steps and levels. So what I really like here, for example, step one is identifying a survivor uh, when you come to train teachers, counselors, and nurses. So like nurses, for example, if someone is missing school because she has very painful periods two weeks at a time, that might be something that a nurse would point out, for example. Uh, these are key players. Every, all of these key players would work together. And then you go to the next stage and then the third stage, fourth stage, and then, and so on. And it provides very good protocol to follow through, but it also creates things like an FGMC consultant which would be nice to have in each of our communities. Uh, now, social services is another area. I mentioned um, that uh, there's a bit of distrust, for example. So like, for example, uh, the uh, Franklin County Children's Service has a huge number of resources for families who might be at risk of this, um, but people are distrustful towards them, so might not really ask them for help. Uh, but one of the things that I liked about the social services uh, available in the UK that is also available nationally is they've made an assessment tool. And you could actually just look this up and do it yourself and make up your own scenario. So you'll put in, they have questions, for example, of, um, you know, are both parents, you know, planning uh, keen on having their daughter undergo FGM? Well, if both parents, then that's a higher risk factor than if it was one parent, for example. You know, uh, have they already, you know, reserved a ticket? Well, then that goes right away to a significant risk factor. And right away, they they're action, they're actually have things like a protective mandate in the UK for FGM uh, girls who are at risk, for example. And so what it does is it divides these up into the child's development needs, parenting capacity, wider family and environmental factors, and divides, gives a number for each of these. 
Um, and depending on what that number is, there's a protocol to follow. And so that was one of my recommendations um, for the, um, when I was talking to the uh, Franklin County Children's Services is to really develop an FGM assessment tool that really will be more accurate in knowing and, and really defining what to do next. You know what I mean? Like I said, these girls are not always completely abused in their homes. These parents generally want what's good for them. And maybe if they had an intervention, they would no longer want to do this to them, for example. So um, let's talk about helping our victims locally for a moment, uh, because this is also a challenge. Um, people don't know where to go. Where do you go? And this is really interesting because, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to mute your microphone, please. Can, can everybody please mute their microphones? So um, uh, one of the psychiatrists was asked, uh, sorry, pediatricians was asking, where do I, she actually found um, a, um, a patient who, a child, a, daughter, a girl who had undergone FGM, and she wanted to send her to be uh, for surgery. And she was like, where do we send these girls? And so it's actually called the Center for Colorectal and Pelvic Reconstruction, which is not the first thing that would come to your mind. Uh, but these are the best place to go. Uh, they actually have uh, Dr. Gary Hewitt, who is an incredible uh, OBGYN uh, physician, and she goes there. She does adult and children, and then they have a urology team, and they both work together to do the proper surgery that's needed. Uh, for older women, um, actually Nationwide takes up through the age of 26, so they could actually go through them. You just have to call and make an appointment. Um, and they do cover uh, individuals who don't have insurance. So please, please, if you do know any younger victims, send them over there. Uh, for the older women, you do have, uh, it's called urogynecology, okay? Uh, if you're going through the Ohio Health System, if you're going through the OSU system, it's also called urogynecology or female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. So once again, you go to these websites or call the phones and uh, make an appointment or refer your patients to them. Pelvic floor therapy, uh, again, women's health rehabilitation, they do uh, programs that are specific for FGM um, and urinary incontinence. And there's also a number of private centers that can provide physical therapy. Finding a mental health provider. So I'm throwing this in because a lot of us don't know, um, you know, first of all, there's a lot of stigma that surrounds mental health and we don't know where to send, uh, you know, people who we know. And, um, it's, there's actually quite a few tools that you can use. I really like this tool on um, psychology today. You can actually go there and search for a therapist using language, using uh, culture, religion, and using a certain area. So for this case, for example, trauma and PTSD, you can do a search and it'll come up in your area who is specialized in that. You could search for Arabic. Okay, well, these, these individuals speak Arabic. So somebody might say, no, I want to go to a Muslim therapist. There's also SEMA Mental Health. If you go to SEMAMentalHealth.org, uh, you could find, um, it'll actually show you a map of, uh, and a list of uh, therapists in that area. Um, and lastly, refugee mental health. As I said, there's more and more uh, Egyptians coming to the US as refugees, and uh, they have a huge number of uh, resources on the Refugee Mental Health Resource Network as well. We also have a number of social services. Again, Franklin County does have a numerous number of resources that they can use to fight uh, FGM and to help a family that might be at risk. Um, there's uh, Us Together is a group that we all kind of have our eyes on. I'm not sure if anybody here is from the group uh, attending, but uh, they received a 298,000 um, um, grant uh, by the Department of Justice. And uh, this grant was great because it involved a number of different groups, including uh, Central Ohio Somali Medical Association, uh, Legal Aid Society, Ohio Domestic Violence Network, the Noor Islamic Center, which is um, a very diverse, I would say, Islamic center, the Somali Community Association, the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Church, a Somali Bantu Care, and a New African Immigrants Commission. So it's really exciting to see what they're gonna be doing with that. Uh, My Project USA has a website for um, uh, um, Muslims Against FGM and it has a number of resources and they've also been applying for grants. Muslim Family Services, they have a lot of 
resources for uh, refugees or even just families who speak Arabic because they serve a lot of the Syrian group and uh, they also have a lot of uh, therapists working with them and translation services and a whole lot of other things, whether it's related to domestic violence or other. Uh, Sahiu Dawood Bora, this is a group that's dedicated to uh, the Dawood Bora and they were formed following um, uh, the, uh, the trial that happened in 2017 um, in Michigan, but they're close enough to Ohio to actually have a role if we reached out to them. And then of course you have Chris uh, who also um, have uh, a role, okay? Um, this, I threw this in here. This is a letter that I, it's posted on the uh, Muslims Against FGM um, uh, site for uh, my project USA. And it has a long list of reasons why FGM is haram or a sin. And it talks a lot about the medical factors if you wanna read it. Uh, this is a list of uh, Muslim leaders based in the US who have signed that they are against FGM. And it's really important to reach out to these and incorporate them in any you know, actions or work that you might be doing, you know, reach out to them. You can look up the, um, just look up Muslim leaders stance on FGMC, it's a document. Reach out to these people and tell them, you know, hey, we need your help. We want you to speak or, you know, um, to reaffirm your, your strengths, uh, your opinions. There's a huge number of useful links. Um, the WHO, the CDC, um, I can, copy and paste this and put it in the chat box if you want after I'm done. Uh, there's also, if you wanna read books, I really recommend this book by Hagada Sheikh. Hagada Sheikh is a Sudanese uh, activist. She's a refugee. She went through domestic violence and she also went through uh, female genital mutilation. She has a whole chapter dedicated to how it was. And it's interesting because in her case, it was her grandmother and they actually had to wait until her father was traveling to do it because he was against it. And um, she talks about how it affected her relationships and even her getting, you know, prenatal care, um, you know, for the rest of her life, pretty much. And she's an incredible person to follow. I recommend it. Desert Flower. I'm sure you've heard of Wedis Did I? She. This is all the way from the '90s or uh, the early 2000s, and. Uh, she's done incredible work with her foundation in Europe. Um, you could also watch the movie. My only, you know, the only thing is just that she's a supermodel and, you know, not all of us can relate to a supermodel, but uh, definitely her, what she went through is legitimate and she, um, it's an interesting book or movie. Um, I, I like the book better than the movie. Uh, Who Fears Death? This is an interesting book because it's uh, by a um, Sudanese American. And it has a lot of animism, as we mentioned, which is a tribal uh, kind of um, a, an ancient religion uh, that gives spiritual, um, you know, it gives a spirit to inanimate objects. And so on. it's a very, um, what's the word? I'm not sure how to describe it, but in the book, she talks about FGM uh, through, um, through this spiritual kind of, um, kind of approach. Um, it's a fascinating book. Uh, there's also movies. There's a series called uh, Bint Ismahazet, and this is an interesting series because it's an Egyptian series. This particular scene is when she's a little girl and they have this midwife lady coming to cut for her, cut her genitals basically and undergo FGM, and it follows her, her through her entire life and how she um, how she's completely devastated when she gets married, how it, you know, affects her relationship with her husband. Uh, there's one point where she's actually happy that he's watching porn, so he doesn't ask her to sleep with him, um, to have sex with him, and uh, all the way through until, like, her, her, grand, her mother is trying to encourage her to uh, do FGM to her daughters, and she refuses. So that's a very interesting uh, series. Uh, there's also this other movie called Asrar al Benet. Uh, it's also on YouTube. And this is crazy. This is a movie uh, where um, a young teenage girl has a baby out of wedlock and the obstetrician who delivers her decides to cut off her clitoris as a form of punishment. So if you're interested in reading those books or going through these movies, these are also um, I, things you can do. Um, last of all, I'm just gonna read this poem and um, it's called, um, <clears throat> I wish. I wish to overcome this emptiness of fear, the incompleteness of life, 
The lingering search for my innocence, the memories of the painful cut, the fierce grip and my tremble under your gaze, the masking of my face and my soul, the mishandling of my body, the pains never expressed and the scars forever inflicted. I wish to overcome this feeling of brokenness, of incompleteness. And this was a quote by a victim that um, I interviewed and she wanted me to tell everybody, I want to tell the parent that mutilation is very harmful to your daughter. You didn't protect her by it, instead you destroyed her marriage relationship. So this is the end of this lecture. Um, here is my email. If anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and write it in the chat box and I'd be happy to answer any questions right now. I'll also go ahead and just um, copy paste some of these links in case any of you want to take it from the chat box. So somebody is asking me about the Dawoodi Boras. This lecture is focused on the Egyptian diaspora. Um, I did mention the Dawoodi Boras in the, um, as an examples of Muslim groups that do it. And of course, uh, the famous trial that took place in Michigan. Um, the best group to follow for, uh, to follow the, the cases of the Dawoodi Boras here in the US is the Sahiyu group. And um, they are an excellent, excellent resource. Like I said, this lecture was mainly focused on the Egyptian diaspora. All right, well, in that case, we'll stop there. And thank you so much for attending. I appreciate it. And please do email me or reach out if you would like to, if you have any questions or anything else. Thank you very much.